So it shan't take us too long today. Matthew chapter 23, verses 1 through 15. And the King James text today, I'll put it on the screen. Amen. The King James text today reads, Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men rabbi rabbi but be not ye called rabbi for one is your master even Christ and all ye are brethren and call no man your father upon the earth for one is your father which is in heaven neither be ye called masters for one is your master even Christ but he that is greatest among you shall be your servant and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted but woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men for ye neither go in yourselves neither suffer ye or permit ye them that are entering to go in woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye devour widows houses and for a pretense make long prayer therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation woe unto you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte and when he is made ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves amen want to talk to us for a while today on the topic making monsters instead of saints if you'll bow your head with me once again Master, Savior, King, love of our soul, we come before you right now, God, the Word of God in hand, opened, ready to impart unto the people of God the Word of the Lord which you've placed in your servant's heart for this moment and this hour. Lord, I know, God, that you are an architect divine. You do things in such a manner as to boggle the mere human mind. It is impossible for us to understand the workings of our God. And I believe, Lord, there will be those, if not watching live, those who will watch later, who will desperately need to hear the exact words that you have placed in my spirit to speak at this moment and at this time. Lord, I need the anointing, I need the touch of the Holy Ghost. How on earth can I be effective in doing the work of the pulpit without the anointing? I cannot. Anoint the speaker today by the great power of the Holy Ghost. 
The Lord touch his will every ear of every hearer. Let a heart at this moment be prepared to receive, Lord, that wonderful word which you're about to impart unto us by your spirit. Help us, Lord, to be receptive. Let it do a work in us even as we hear it. For we ask it all today and none other than Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Much of the Christian world today is made up of preachers, teachers, denominations, and church folks who are more gifted at creating demonic monsters than they are discipling believers and creating saints. Sadly, the reputation of the church and attitudes in the world toward the gospel are suffering terribly as many churches churn out Frankenstein monsters instead of men like Paul and Peter, James and John. On the first day of the year 1818, a young author by the name of Mary Shelley anonymously published a book in which the infamous monster Frankenstein made his first appearance. He was the product of stitching together many various dead parts from a variety of recently dead men. And this monster was brought to life by electricity. So too the church today is made up of men and women who are the byproduct of stitching together various doctrines and dogmas which each breed death and possess within them no life. The end result is a patchwork of death presenting itself as life. But a patchwork man comprised of dead parts animated by electricity cannot function as a man ought to function. If you remember, if you've ever watched the old Boris Karloff movies, Frankenstein, yes, he was made up of human parts. Yes, he looked like something near a man. And yet, he could not speak as a man. He could not think as a man. He could not reason as a man. He could not function as a man. Well, I'm going to tell you, when you take a whole bunch of dead doctrines and doctrines of devils that breed nothing but death and destruction, the Word of God declares, the letter killeth, but the Spirit maketh alive. Too many can read the letter of the Word of God, but they do not understand the spirit of it. They're not able to understand the whole picture because they're so busy trying to make something out of this little piece over here or this little piece over here, and they'll take something out of context. I don't mean out of context strictly in the context of what is written, but out of context in terms of the whole picture of the entire story of the gospel. They'll take this little piece, Tommy, and they will stitch it to another piece, and they'll stitch it to another piece. But every piece they're stitching is dead. Every single part they're putting together, they ain't life in none of it. And then they animate it. See, this is where the problem is. Just because you can animate your message doesn't mean your message is living. Just because you're preaching an animated sermon preacher, just because you can get up and shout and scream and carry on about it, honey, I can out shout and out scream just about anybody when it comes to preaching what I preach because I believe what I'm preaching and I preach what I believe. I preach it the way I feel it. I feel it the way I preach it. I'm not up here putting on a show. I'm not up here playing a game. This is real to me. My job is more than merely 
to allow the words that I speak to be heard in your hearing, but it is my job to present the message in such a manner as to convince you. I remember I, I went to college in Connecticut for a bit. I attended uh, courses at Central Connecticut State University, and I had a uh, political science professor bright and early in the morning. Uh, one day a week, I went to this class, and uh, it was like 8 o'clock in the morning, and we were there for three hours plus, you know, it was a, a one day a week class. And uh, this guy would get up and do his lecture. Of course, I was in a university, so there were lots of students. There were probably 200 students. He, did, he didn't know any of us. If he passed any of us in the hall, he wouldn't even know we were his students, you know. But he'd get up in front of that class, and he would do the lecture. And he would present it in a fashion that was so droll, so monotone so boring I'm not kidding that dozens of those kids the young people in there I was a little bit older than they I didn't go to school till I was quite a bit older and they'd be falling asleep all over the class people be falling asleep finally one day I got so tired of it I wasn't in ministry at the time this is during the time I was out of church for a few years and one day I went to the dean's office and I went to the dean and I said, listen, how on earth, how on earth can you employ a man to teach a course whose presentation of that course is so boring and so off-putting that students by the dozens are falling asleep in his 8 a.m. class. And the dean said, actually, he said, you're not the first to complain of this. You're not the first to tell me about this. He said, we're looking into it and we're going to have to do something. Long story short, before too long, that uh, professor was released from the university and uh, they had to bring somebody else in. His presentation was so horrific that you couldn't receive anything he had to say because you just couldn't even stay focused. You can pick fun at this preacher hollering and screaming and jumping and spitting and sputtering sometimes. You know, you can have all the problem you want with us Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, tongue talking, Jesus name preachers. You can have all the criticism you want, but I'll tell you one thing, you don't go to sleep during one of my messages. I apologize, I'm not Joel Osteen. I'm sorry that I cannot get up in front of the church and maintain this plastic smile the entire time that I'm speaking and just do it in this soft voice. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Preachers like that bore the pants off of me. I grew up in a church where the preacher preached like he meant what he was saying. You never one time questioned whether the pastor believed the things that he was preaching. No, why? Because he presented it in such a fashion. He presented it with passion. He presented it with fire. And I don't mean hellfire and brimstone. I don't mean negative foolishness. No, even the good stuff, even the positive stuff. Man, he preached it like he meant it, and he preached it with passion. And whoo, boy, howdy, I'll tell you what. Watch a coach deliver a, a pregame speech to his team and see if he stands there and talks to them like he's just having a conversation with the guy next door. Well, y'all need to get out there and just really play and play like you've never played before. And I don't know if y'all have ever watched uh, 
coach on television with uh, Greg T. Nelson, but that show used to be one of my favorites, I'll tell you. And you watch Coach give a speech, man. I'll tell you, that man, whoo, he could inspire you. He could get you fired up. He could get you riled up. That's what we go to the house of God for, to get fired up, to get charged up. Now, hopefully, you're going to a church where they're preaching the right message. If you go to a church where they're preaching a bunch of crap and they're preaching Trump and they're preaching mega, yeah, they're still trying to fire up the crowd. But did you hear what I said a moment ago? An animated message is not the same as the message with life in it. Just because you could animate the Frankenstein monster didn't mean that in reality you had brought life to those parts. No, you really hadn't. There were, he had no life. He wasn't living a life. No, he was existing. A lot of Christians go to churches and they hear a hosh posh of doctrines and dogmas which have been made up of bits and pieces of scripture pulled out of context and stitched together. And the preacher gets up and he tries to animate the message by shouting it screaming and hollering and hooting but honey if the spirit does not stand behind the message that's what we call the anointing that's why preachers get up and preach the way they do it's called the anointing it helps the Lord literally helps us to deliver a word in such a way so as uh, to allow the people who are listening to receive it and absorb it and, and, and to glean the reaction that the Lord wants them to glean. In other words, sometimes you come into the house of God and you're so beat down, the world has been hard, you've had a rough week, work has just pummeled you, people have mistreated you, you've had a difficult time, and you come into the house of God, and my Lord, that preacher gets up and he preaches a message with fire, he preaches a message with fervor, he preaches a message with passion and guess what happens not only do you hear what he has said but you feel inspired you feel uplifted you feel encouraged all of a sudden you leave the church I'm going to tell you a little secret you can make fun of the way this old preacher preaches all you want to but honey I'm going to tell you what there ain't a Sunday that I go home that I don't feel a whole lot better leaving than, than I did coming in amen and I'm going to tell you a little secret. This ministry, this preacher been doing what I'm doing now in the LGBT community for 31 years. And I can't even count how many people have said that to me over the years. You know, Pastor, there's not a Sunday I don't leave that I don't feel better. Didn't Johnny used to say that? Didn't Bill used to say that? Didn't uh, uh, Jack used to say that? Amen. I can go down a list a, a mile long of people who have told me that. And they say, every Sunday, man, I go home and I'm ready for the next week. I might come in beat up, tore up. I might come in just feeling like I'm barely dragging into the house of God. But by the time I leave, man, I'm ready to take on whatever the devil and the world throws at me. Amen. There's a reason why we preach the way we preach. It's not about trying to animate a false message. It is about trying, listen to me, to inject the life-giving spirit to the words. Because the word, the law, killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. That's why the word of God tells us, faith cometh by hearing, by hearing, by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That's why the Word of God tells us that God chose the foolishness of preaching to save them that are lost. God doesn't use the printed Word, folks. I got news for you. You can print all the magazines uh, out of Brooklyn, New York, you want to print. You can print all the uh, publications out of Springfield, Missouri, you want to print. Those publications might 
encouraged. Those publications might inspire. They might say good things. They might educate. But the Word of God declares that God chose preaching to be the vehicle whereby people are saved. He chose preaching to be the vehicle whereby our faith grows and is nurtured and enhanced. <sighs> Why? Because the Spirit anoints the individual who is preaching and thereby interjects the Spirit of God into and through the Word of God. And it brings that Word to life in your spirit. So that when you leave, if you've heard the truth and you know it's the truth of God, you leave. You don't leave some sewed up monster who's made up of a bunch of dead parts. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You leave somebody who is whole, who is complete, somebody who has genuine spiritual life in their body. The Word of God tells us in 2 Peter 2, verses 1 and 2, Peter writes, But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily or secretly shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow, many shall follow, not a few, not a smattering, many shall follow their pernicious ways. Listen, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. There is a reason today why Christianity bears such a terrible reputation in our world. And it is because we've got churches churning out monsters mm -hmm. instead of saints. Amen. Mm -hmm. the word of God warned us this was going to happen he said there are false teachers there were false prophets he said there will be false teachers among you honey we got false teachers and false prophets among us today some of them are the biggest on television and they are turning out monsters instead of saints am I telling the truth today in Matthew 7 verses 15 through 20 Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ writes, uh, speaks and says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. It's not hard to know which preachers are preaching the truth and which preachers are not. What do you see coming out of their church? Monsters? Or saints? Do you see people that are living? I told, I've told this so many times, but it bears repeating. When I first moved to Texas, you know, and I would go to do business in certain uh, businesses around Fort Worth and all, and I would mention to the proprietor or to the salesperson or somebody, I'd say something to the effect, well, you know, yeah, I, I go to Riverside Church of God. And the first thing I'd hear is, oh, that brother and sister Gillum, oh, they are the, those are the most sweet, the most loving, the most godly people I've ever known in my life. I'm Church of Christ, but I'm going to tell you something, I've never seen people live Christianity like those people live Christianity. 
And oh, you know, I, I, we've got a lot of their folks in our church, and I mean, in our that do business with us. And boy, let me tell you, my God, those are they're they're just like their pastor. They're the most loving. They're the most generous. They're the most kind. They're the most thoughtful. They're the most compassionate. They're the most charitable people that I've ever known. I've never seen a church like it. That Riverside Church is really something else. Because I'm going to tell you something. I remember Brother uh, Ellis from the United Pentecostal Church in uh, Milford, Connecticut many years ago. He preached a Pentecostal camp meeting and Brother Ellis said, Preacher, don't you ever think for one minute that your people will go further than you do. He said, if you're not trying to live love like you ought to live love, said, don't expect your people to be living it. It'll never happen. He said, if you're not showing compassion, if you're not showing grace, if you're not being charitable, your people aren't going well either. He said, I ain't never seen a church in my life where the people outpace the pastor in the way they live their faith. Oh my goodness. You got a pastor who's compassionate? Do you have a pastor who cares about people? Do you have a pastor who performs charitable acts on a regular basis? Brother Gillum used to do things constantly. That man was doing something. You know, he was so kind to me. I was just a teenager, moved to, to Texas by myself at 16 years old, living on my own and struggling to pay my rent and, and have a place to live and still going to high school, trying to finish high school, working a job, a full-time job, no less. I mean, I, and I was in church every single Sunday and every single Wednesday. Back then, you actually could tell your boss, Boss, I won't work Wednesdays and they wouldn't schedule you for Wednesday so I told my boss back then this is back in the early 80s I told my boss I said listen I go to church on Sunday and I go to church on Wednesday night so I need those two times I'll work during the day Wednesday but I better be out of here by say 536 because I got to be at the church house by I think we started at 7 or 730 and luckily, Riverside Church was just down the road from where I lived and where I worked, you know. But the Word of God said, you can tell who the right people are and who the wrong people are, Jesus said, by a very simple test. He said, their fruit. Look at their fruit. Do you see a bunch of hateful Trump worship and mega screaming nuts coming out of their church because if you do honey got news for you they're a false prophet they're a false teacher I'm going to tell it plain that's the only way I know how to preach it's plain or do you see people coming out of there who can love somebody who is everything they disagree with who can love somebody who is everything that they dislike and they disprove of. I've told you before, I had a friend, now I wasn't real close to him in a lot of ways, you know, um, in, in New York, who was uh, a priest in this African religion. I told you the story about him, you know. Listen, you can't win anybody that you're not willing to be friendly with. And when I say friendly, I don't mean a false smile and a fake grin and, you know, and, and putting on this act of being kind. No, no, no. I'm talking about really being. He, he was a friend. If he needed me for something and he asked me for help, I would go. I did. I would go and help him, you know. Uh, I forget where we met. But, you know, the thing is, uh, one of my best friends in the world I met in that same school I was talking about a while ago, Central Connecticut State University. I went to take a bus one day somewhere. And these two girls were sitting, waiting on the same bus, and they started talking to each other, and I heard a Scottish accent. And now my family is of Scots descent on my mother's dad's side, uh, straight out of Scotland. On my mother's mom's side, they were straight out of Portugal, so it was Portugal and Scotland coming together in my mother's home. And uh, we're proud of our Scottish heritage, I'm going to tell you. 
and, and uh, anybody who knows anything about Scots knows that they tend to be very proud of their heritage. So anyway, I heard that accent, and I was like, oh, I, I turned, I said, by any chance, are you from Scotland? And she said, yes, I am. And so we started talking, you know, and next thing you know, we became friends. The next thing you know, we'd go out, my goodness, three nights a week, we'd get together and go out and do something, you know, and have a good time. And she and I became the best of friends. And uh, when she went back to Scotland, she had a baby. She, had, she married the fellow that she had been living with. She had a baby, and we talked on the phone regularly. And she said, oh, Charles, I wish you could come to Scotland so you could see the baby and blah, blah, blah. Finally, one day I had the means, and I said, Fiona, of course, wouldn't you know her name be Fiona? There's probably no more uh, atypical name, <laughs> typical name for, Scot for Scotland than Fiona. And her husband's name was Ian. <laughs> I mean, like the two most common names. And uh, Fiona said, oh, I wish you could come to Scotland to see the baby. You know, her baby at that point was not, I think, a year old or so. And the f finally, a little while later, before before the baby turned two, I had the, re the resources. And I said, Fiona, I can come. I said, if I come off season, it'll save me a lot of money. I can afford the flight and the hotels and everything. And so I got to fly to Scotland. I spent almost a week in uh, London. I spent a week in Scotland. And I had also befriended a friend of hers who happened to be gay. And he and I became friends just over the phone and writing letters. He, he used to write the most lovely letters. And with nothing romantic, but just friends, you know. And he had found a life partner and everything, and he invited us to come stay with him for a few days. I had a wonderful, wonderful time. Now let me tell you, for all that, Fiona was an atheist, a vegetarian, <laughs> and a socialist. At the time, I was still a gay Republican. You couldn't have got anybody more different than me than Fiona. That girl and I were so different, it wasn't even funny. But you know what? We liked each other as human beings. We respected one another. We would talk about disagreements. We would talk, and sometimes they'd get a little heated. Not arguing, but you know, we'd be passionate in it. But it has been about 40 years now since I met her. We're still friends to this day. You know why? Because I can love people. You don't have to look like me for me to love you. You don't have to believe like me for me to love you. I love Tommy's parents to death. I think they're some of the sweetest people. I, I mean this from the bottom of my heart. I think they're some of the sweetest people. I, pr I pray for their salvation. But I love them to death. The fact that they're in a, a religious organization that I detest only makes me pity them, to be honest. Doesn't make me hate them. You know, uh, I have feelings and beliefs concerning certain religious groups like the uh, Catholic Church and Mormonism and all that. But have I ever in my life mistreated, misspoken to, or acted poorly toward a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness? Not that I know of. Why should I? Why? Well, that, I don't even understand the logic of that. You know, how can I win anybody if I'm going to approach them in an unchristlike manner? If I have any hope of ever, ever, ever being an influence in their life. But you know, I'll tell you, the Baptists are really famous for this. This is one of their biggest things. They act like, honey, if I don't get you converted today, it's never going to happen. You know why? Because they don't believe in God, and they don't believe the Word of God, and they don't believe what Scripture says. Scripture says, no man cometh unto the Father except the Spirit draw him. You know what? God may put somebody in your life today so that 30 years from now your testimony and your influence in their life will help them find the truth. You see, 
God's not on our timetable, folks. God doesn't work on our timetable. You know, there's there's this, Tommy and I were talking coming into church today about how growing up as a kid, you know, preachers used to love to use all the scare tactics. My friend, are you ready for heaven? Are you ready if Jesus should come to die? Oh, hallelujah. Oh, what if you leave this place and you get hit by a bus? Will your soul slide into hell and burn for eternity because you did not make your mind up today to live for the Lord and be saved? And they would put you through this emotional uh, manipulation. And that I'm being honest. I'm not even lying. I'm being honest. That's what it is. I've been preaching the old CDT affirmant for 31 years. Tommy and I have been together almost 23 years. I asked him today, I said, have you ever in 20-something years ever heard me preach that kind of crap? Have you ever heard me try to manipulate people through emotional manipulation? No, nope. never. I don't do it. I don't do it. Honey, if you believe this gospel because I'm preaching it, if you believe this message, I have a very, very, very hands-off approach to it. And I have. I've been like this going back to before I ever came out and started affirming ministry. I've always believed the same way. Always. I could... That... that manipulation crap never settled with me even when I was preaching in the mainstream. So I didn't do it then either. My thought is, listen, the Word of God said I'm to preach it, I'm to teach it, and I have no control whatsoever over your reaction. I have no control whatsoever how people respond. But if you respond to it, if you suddenly say, wait a minute, I get it, I understand. Man, wow, yes, now I understand. Pastor, will you baptize me in Jesus' name? Yes, sir, I will. But have you ever seen me stand in this pulpit and try to emotionally, emotionally manipulate people into being baptized in the name of the Lord? No, no. I don't do it. Have you ever seen me stand up here and try to preach people into hysterics uh, so that they'll want to pray through to the Holy Ghost today? No, I don't do it. Because the best way is God's way. And the Word of God teaches us that as pastors, we're supposed to be gentle and we're supposed to be uh, patient with the saints. So it's not about trying to push them into the next experience. It's not about trying to push them into the next level. It's not about trying to force them into compliance. No, you're just supposed to gently provide direction so that you can guide them and lead them and point them in the right way. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? You want to know if a pastor's preaching the right message or if he's just preaching a patchwork of dead parts and then trying to animate it through his preaching all you gotta do is look at what comes out of the church when he's done do you see monsters or do you see saints the Lord said in our primary text today the last verse verse 15 Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye come past, ye travel sea and land, to make one proselyte, to convert one person. And when he is made, or when he is converted, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. He said, you turn them into monsters. Not bad enough that you've got to make up rules and regulations that make it harder and harder and harder for people to try to live for God. Not bad enough that you try to apply rules to others that you're not willing to live up to yourself. Not bad enough that your religion is all show. I've had people in our church who come from Pentecostal background that got upset with me because 
I don't believe in praying in public places and making a show of, of praying a blessing over your meal. I ask the Lord to bless my meal. You don't even know I've done it. You know why? Because according to the way I read my Bible, that's how you're supposed to do it. The Lord said in our primary text, he said, y'all make a show of praying. Oh, I just love watching these people in restaurants, out in public. Oh, they got to hold hands. They got to make a big show. Oh, they all got to sit there and make out. Oh, we want the world to know we're Christians. That's not why you pray, stupid. Praying has nothing to do with showing the world anything. But see, that's what motivates them. All these good Baptist folk, bless God, if I go to Whitney's, I'm going to sit there and pray a prayer in front of the world before I eat my hamburger. Well, then I got news for you. You're a hypocrite. You're nothing but a show dog or a show pony. That's all you are. Your religion is trash. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you're to do anything, anything, anything in public to show the world. No, my Bible said, By this shall all men know that you're my disciples, if you have love one to another. Honey, if you know how to love like Jesus loved, if you can love the sinner and the same alike, if you can love people who agree with you the same way you can love people who disagree with you, that's how they'll know you're a child of God. Not because you bow your head and make a show at every bloody restaurant you eat in. Nowhere in Scripture does it say that that's how you're supposed to demonstrate your faith. But you see, we've got Christians in the world today, monsters, who've turned the Christian faith into nothing but pure garbage. They do all the things they're not supposed to do. They sin in judgment. They criticize. They condemn. They scream. They holler. They act hatefully, hatefully, maliciously, and then have the gall to stand there and tell the unbeliever, the only reason I'm acting this way is because I love you. You're a liar and the father of lies. How many men beat their wives or beat their children? How many women beat their children and tell their kids, I only do this because I love you. No, it's abuse. It's abuse. It's abuse. Preacher, it's spiritual abuse. You can stand there and tell people you love them while you're beating them bloody, but the truth of the matter is you're abusing them and you will answer to God one day in the judgment. Don't you think for one second that you won't. We know what the fruit of the Spirit is. We know what to look for in the life of God's people. According to the Word of God, but the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22, 23, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, Against such, there is no law. Lord said, you ain't going to, or, or excuse me, Paul said, you're not going to find a law anywhere against any of the things that you ought to be seeing in the life of a believer. There ain't no country anywhere that's going to outlaw love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. So nowhere, anywhere, you're going to find laws against these things. But these are the things that are manifested in the life of God's people. Not things we have to manufacture to try to demonstrate that we're a believer. No, 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 no. If the tree is healthy, then the fruit will be there. If the believer is spiritually healthy, then these fruits are going to be there, period. They don't have to make it happen. They don't have to try to demonstrate or try to produce these things. No, 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 no. 
Does the tree work at creating apples? Does the pear tree work to create pears? Where do you see a pear tree or an apple tree going? Oh, let me try to squeeze out an apple. But do you know how many Christians, you know how many times I heard sermons growing up as a kid about how Christians are supposed to uh, demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit? And the message literally made it sound like it was our job to try to make these things appear. No. No. A believer doesn't have to work at these things. If the believer is spiritually healthy. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. It's the will of the Father that you bear much fruit. As long as you stay plugged into the vine. Honey, the problem is we got too many preachers preaching a false message of a bunch of dead parts. They're not plugging you into the vine and that's why there's no fruit there. I'm going to tell you something about this church. I don't care if you're straight or gay. I don't care who you are, where you live, what you believe, where you come from. I'm going to tell you a little secret about this church. I know for a fact that Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday that this preacher gets up in this pulpit and tries to encourage God's people to live like Christians are supposed to live. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I'm not talking about don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, don't go there. No, I'm talking about living a life of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Hello now, am I telling the truth? I know for a fact that's our message. I know that anybody wants to can go back a year, ten years, whatever you want to go back in this church. Look at our messages going back for decades. And every single one of them, I guarantee you, I'm encouraging God's people to act like God's people are supposed to act. I've told this story before. I'll tell it again. I, years ago, I was living in East Texas not too long before I came out, probably a year or two before I came out. And I, I used to go into this little uh, gas station, they had a little restaurant like in the gas station, and they also had a, a convenience store, you know. And I lived in a little trailer nearby, not too far from this little gas station slash restaurant slash convenience store. And uh, since I lived by myself, you know, and I and I, I was constantly by myself, so I would go a lot of times to this little place. And I'd sit down at the table and I'd buy a hot dog. I love their they have the best hot dogs, and I like a good hot dog. So I'd buy me a hot dog and a coke, you know, and I'd sit there, and I'd read my Bible, and because I I told you I've spent years and years and years just diving into the Word of God. And I'd read my Bible and stuff, and I wouldn't bother nobody, and nobody bothered me. And every once in a while, though, I'd be sitting there, and somebody would come past me, and I would just feel in my spirit something was wrong, something wasn't right. Sometimes it, a young lady might have tears in her eyes, or a young man might have a sullen look on his face. And I'd kind of reach out and touch him and just tap him and say, Hey, hey, I'm, I'm a preacher, I said, you look like you're going through something. I said, can I help you? Is there something I can do for you? And you'd be shocked how many times they say, oh, yes. And they'd sit down across from me. We'd start talking. And I'd start counseling with them and talking to them and encouraging them. And by the time they left, they were smiling and they were encouraged. God put me in the right place at the right time to be a blessing to somebody. Well, this young lady that worked at the, uh, at the store, she was older than I was, probably by at least 10 years, but I was, you know, uh, I don't know if 20-something, 20 22 or so. She's probably in her 30s. And one day she said to me, she said, you know, Charles, she said, honestly, she said, I've got to tell you, she said, I have never seen anybody that lives the Christian life the way you live it. She said, you really, honest to God, live this thing like it's real to you and she said I watch you you come in you sit down there 
you read your Bible. She said, but if somebody's hurting, if somebody's going, she said, boy, you reach out to them. And she said, and by the time they leave, they're smiling and they're happy and they're encouraged. And she said, and I've spent hours talking to you about God and about the Word of God. She said, and you're just always so full of positivity and so excited to talk about Jesus. She didn't ever catch me talking politics. She didn't ever catch me talking about Obama. She didn't ever catch me talking, uh, or back then, you know, talking about Jimmy, uh, well, a little bit later than Jimmy Carter, you know. Uh, but, you know, that was not my subject of conversation. If I talk to you at all, I won't talk to you about Jesus. If I talk to you about anything, I won't talk to you about the Word of God. I'm not interested in talking current events. I'm not interested in talking about politics. Now I can get caught in that trap. Don't misunderstand. I'm not standing here saying I'm perfect. I can get caught in that trap, but that's why I try to avoid it as much as I can so I don't get caught in that trap. Especially nowadays. But I want to tell you folks, when you live this thing like you're supposed to live it, you stand out from the crowd. I told you my brother one time, my baby brother Michael, who's just a year and change younger than I am, he told me one day years ago after I'd come out, and he told me, he said, you know, when we were kids going to high school together and stuff, he said, I was never so proud in my life as to be able to claim you were my brother. And I looked at him, and, my, and if he, Tommy knows my brother, so to hear him say something like that was quite shocking, you know. And I looked at him and I said, well, what are you talking about? He said, Chuck, when we were kids going to high school and your nickname was Rev and everybody used to refer to you as Rev, I used to wear a necktie to school, to high school. And a lot of people thought I was on the faculty. <laughs> but anyhow, and uh, kids had stopped me to tell me troubles they were going through. I had kids call me at home suicidal that I was able to talk down, talk them out of a, out of hanging themselves, so to speak. And uh, it was quite an experience. It was a wonderful experience. I, I remember those days so fondly. It was a wonderful experience. All I was trying to do was live the Christian life the way a Christian is supposed to live it. That's all I was trying to do to the best of my ability. And my brother Michael said, I was never so proud of my life. He said, every time somebody, I'd introduce myself to somebody and they'd say, Mauro, are you related to Rev? You know, because that was my nick. Are you related to Rev? And he'd say, yeah. They said, he said, uh, yeah, he's my older brother. And he said, man, if I heard it once, I heard it a thousand times. Man, you can't, that guy's a goody two shoes. You couldn't get him to do nothing wrong. You couldn't get him to act wrong. You couldn't, you couldn't force him to do something that wasn't right. And my brother said, well, yeah, he says, uh, he, takes, he takes Christianity very seriously. He tries to live what he, what he believes and believes what he lives. I do, I still do. I don't do the best job of it always, but I try real hard. In the era of Trump, it's getting harder and harder, but I'm not going to say any more than that. The Word of God says, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new commandment I give you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. There are many people who try to suggest that what the Lord was saying here was that Christians ought to love other Christians. I heard that preached my whole life growing up as a kid, that you love one another. He's talking about the church, you know. There ought to be love in the church. No, listen, keeping the Word of God in context, line upon line, precept upon precept. Here a little, there a little. Luke 6, 27 through 38. But I say unto you which hear, love your enemies. Do good to them which hate you. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. And unto him that smiteth thee on the one cheek, offer also the other. And him that taketh away thy cloak 
Forbid not to take thy coat also. Give to every man that asketh of thee and of him that taketh away thy goods. Ask them not again. And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Now listen. For if ye love them which love you, what thank have ye? For sinners love also love those that love them. And if ye do good to them which do good to you, what thank have ye? For sinners also do even the same. And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies and do good and lend hoping for nothing again and your reward shall be great and ye shall be the children of the highest for he is kind unto the thankful and to the evil be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful judge not and ye shall not be judged. Condemn not, and ye shall not be condemned. Forgive, and ye shall be forgiven. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you. Again, no, he was not saying Christians ought to love Christians. He was saying Christians ought to love, period. Mm -hmm. He said, you don't just love those that love you back. He said, love your enemies. Hello now. So if we're going to keep this thing in context, that Jesus was saying, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples. If you have love one to another, meaning to mankind, to the human race, if you're able to love other people, period enemy and friend alike believer and unbeliever alike believers should stand out in the world we ought not to resemble the carnal world in which we live full of malice anger resentment angst revenge but rather we ought to reflect the qualities that demonstrate our heavenly citizenship in Philippians 3, 17 through 21, Paul writes, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have us for an example. He said, in other words, if they don't walk like we walk, if they don't live like we live, then mark them. Take note of them. Those are not the people you want to be around. Verse 18, For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Listen, who mind earthly things. Well, I'll tell you, the church today is full of people who call themselves Christians who are more mindful of earthly things than they are heavenly. He said, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Like the infamous monster Frankenstein, too many so-called Christians today are afraid of fire. They don't live for the Lord out of love and devotion for the God who became a man so that he might redeem us unto himself. No, that's not why they live for God. But rather they live in constant fear of this same God and preach a message that is rooted in fear. Every truth of the Christian faith is preached with the intent, listen, by these people, 
to muster fear and not faith. How many preachers you hear, you know by the message they're preaching that the end game is fear. Mm -hmm. They're not preaching anything to inspire faith. Every word they say is to inspire fear. Every mention even of the rapture of the church, the most glorious hope that we as believers have, every mention of the rapture is meant to scare people into the altars rather than to inspire saints to shout with joy. Who I won't tell you, glory to God. I remember at Riverside years ago, uh, Sister Bruce had a little skit she put together, and Brother Gillum let her do it on a Wednesday night, you know. And it was it was a skit where <laughs> they, all they did was clear the pulpit off, you know, the the uh, platform. And Sister Bruce walked up on the platform. She's looking around, and she's saying, Oh, my, it's so much more beautiful than anything I ever dreamed. It's so much more than anything I ever anticipated. The Lord finally came, said, Oh, hallelujah, He finally came, and I'm finally in heaven. And then she said, Oh, I wonder, I wonder if Sister Julie is here, you know. And then Sister Julie went up on there, and they began to talk about, Isn't it wonderful? Have you? seen the streets of gold have you seen the gates of pearl have you seen the mansion shining bright you know and they're talking about heaven and there's oh I wonder if brother Bruce is here and then brother Bruce come up and they begin and you know what happened they got about three people on that platform and the Holy Ghost started moving in that church oh I want to tell you we started feeling the glory of God coming down in that building and then finally sister, uh, sister Bruce said oh I'd love to see Brother Gillum. Now, Brother Gillum didn't know that they were going to do this to him, you know. She said, I'd love to see Brother Gillum. So, Brother Gillum, who was a very, very uh, quiet, gentle kind of a fella, you know, he gets up on the platform and she says, Oh, Brother Gillum, she said, Look, we finally made it. The Lord came. And Brother Gillum. <laughs> Woo, he started feeling the Holy Ghost and he just started getting happy and the whole church started to shout and run the aisles and dance and rejoice because honey there ain't nothing about the rapture to be afraid of glory to God if you're a saint and not a monster you ought not to be afraid of it you ought to look for it hallelujah you ought to be anxious for it you ought to be desiring it with all of your heart. Like Frankenstein. He was terrified of fire. Oh, I got news for you. These fake Christians, these monsters who run around making more monsters and creating monsters worse than themselves, they're terrified of fire. Everything makes them afraid. Everything scares them. The Word of God said in 2 Timothy 1 and 7, there'd be no mega movement in America if it weren't for fear. There'd be no mega movement in America if it wasn't for preachers preaching a message of fear. But the Word of God tells us 2 Timothy 1 and 7, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 18, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep, in Jesus will God bring with him for this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain under the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Listen. Wherefore, verse number 18, chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I spent my whole life growing up in a Pentecostal church. They didn't use these words to comfort. They used these words to terrify. They used this very passage to try to scare people into the kingdom of heaven. Lastly today, 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead and his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts or their own desires shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Got news for you, children. Mega is a fable. It is a lie and it is a distraction. American exceptionalism is a fable. It is a lie and it is a distraction. It is a tool used by Satan to get the church off of its proper mission and set it off on a wild goose chase doing political and social crap that it doesn't need to be doing. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist. Do you know what that means? Preach so that the hearer might be saved. Make full proof of thy ministry. Paul writes to Timothy, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, listen, but unto all them also, listen, that love his appearing. My Lord have mercy. Nowhere in the in talking about the return of the Lord are we encouraged to be fearful or be afraid. No, no, we're told comfort one another with these words. We're told the Lord's going to give a crown of righteousness to everybody that loves his appearing. Oh, hallelujah. I got news for you, sweetheart. There ain't nothing in this world that, it, that I'm so in love with that I'm not more looking for the coming of the Lord. In a church today of monster makers, the ministry is committed this ministry, I should say, this one here, that this preacher oversees, is committed to producing saints. Our message is not based in fear, but it is centered on the love and grace of God, which inspires faith, hope, and love. We seek to produce saints, not monsters. And by the help and grace of God, this shall be, this shall we do until that glorious hour when the Son of Man appears in the eastern sky to redeem his purchased possession. A purchased possession described in the Word of God as a glorious church without spot or wrinkle, comprised of blood washed. Saints, Amen. not monsters. Hallelujah.